sexy space aliens, multi-eyed monsters that will rip your head off, and Jackie Robinson taking on Cthulhu. HBO's Lovecraft Country, executive produced by Jordan Peele and J.J. Abrams, promises to take us on a wild ride of sci-fi and horror, and Think Story is here to break down all the episodes, analyze those hidden Easter eggs, and discuss some insane theories for episodes to come. Like, who is this mysterious red hat woman? Who did Atticus call in Korea? And how the hell are T-Bone steaks only 81 cents. A word of warning before we begin, if you're worried about spoiling the 2016 book of which the show is based on, don't worry, I haven't read it. I also do not have advanced copies of the show, so all the theories and discussions are based solely on the info we're given. So with that out of the way, if you want to see more videos like this, make sure to like and subscribe, it really helps the channel. So let's get into it. Welcome to the Korean War. Notice how all the soldiers, our main character Atticus Freeman fights here, are Asian. A clue to where he was deployed during his time in the military. You may also have noticed how the image on screen transitions from black and white to color, from reality to fantasy. This makes sense because it's all a dream, ending with famous African-American baseball player Jackie Robinson beating the shit out of an HP Lovecraft monster known as Cthulhu. I hope I'm saying that right. Jackie is a fitting foe since the background voiceover about a story of a young American boy in his dream is from the 1950 film The Jackie Robinson Story. Now there are some other cool things here, like what appear to be female Roman centurions fighting in the background, and this red-skinned alien, an allusion to the Princess of Mars book that we later see Atticus reading. A Princess of Mars is the story of an ex-soldier who is transported to a new world, kinda like Atticus here who has returned home and must navigate this new world of Lovecraftian horrors. There's a great discussion between Atticus and a woman who were left stranded when the bus broke down on whether or not you can like art if it was written by a racist. HP was a well-documented white supremacist, yet Atticus likes his book. John Carter was an ex-Confederate soldier in the Princess of Mars book, yet Atticus likes reading stories with him in it. As Atticus explains, Stories are like people. Love them doesn't make them perfect. You just try and cherish them. Overlook their flaws. I also want to note that I'm pretty sure the red alien here is the woman Atticus calls in Korea. The actress is Jamie Chung, who plays Ji Ah, who we haven't met yet, and it would make sense since the start of the dream sequence he's fighting in Korea. They embrace, hinting that there may be a love connection between the two. Atticus wakes up from his dream. He's on his way back home to Chicago after receiving a cryptic letter from his father who has gone missing. So he meets up with his uncle George on a quest for answers. His father father's letter exclaims that Atticus has a secret birthright that's been kept from him, that his mother's ancestors hailed from a place called Arkham, Massachusetts, the same name as the publishing firm that printed Lovecraft's collection of short stories, The Outsider and the Others. Arkham is also home of Herbert West, the reanimator, a scientist who can reanimate the dead using a special solution he created. Something tells me he'll be making an appearance in future episodes. George tells Atticus that he's got it all wrong, that it's not Arkham he's looking for, it's Artem with a D. And there just so happens to be a mention of Artem in the fictional Massachusetts County of Devon. But before Atticus sets off, he visits Sammy, the bar owner, one of the last known people to see his father before he disappeared. Sammy's located at Denmark Vesey's bar. Denmark Vesey, the name of a slave who was executed for allegedly planning a revolt. It's fitting that Atticus's father's last known whereabouts was a bar, since it's hinted at that his father is an alcoholic, which could explain Atticus's tumultuous relationship with him. These marks in the wall here were from Atticus being slammed into it by his abusive father. Later in the episode, Atticus calls out his uncle for not doing anything to help him when he was younger. Ironically, this happens when Letty is being abused by her brother. Atticus is about to go in and help when George says this. It's family business. It's not ours. Atticus learns that his father left the bar with a rich white dude in a silver sedan. We'll get to that sedan in a bit as it makes several appearances throughout the episode. I also want to acknowledge this short scene of Atticus walking past the army recruitment office. Two important things to note. One, how the army recruits young African Americans looking for a way out of poverty just like Atticus was recruited. And two, how this links into Atticus's relationship with his father. Their big falling out had to do with him signing up. Atticus's father didn't like 
with the idea of his son fighting for a country that doesn't care about black people. At his father's place, Atticus finds a copy of The Count of Monte Cristo, right next to a bottle of booze, of course. The story is about a man who is wrongfully imprisoned, escapes jail, and sets about exacting revenge on those responsible for his imprisonment. I think it's a little too early to infer why his father was reading this book just yet, but the book gets its own close-up next to a family photo, so we'll keep this in the back of our minds as the episodes continue. Atticus also picks up his father's gun and makes a cryptic phone call to a woman in Korea. He likely met her while deployed there, and the fact she says he shouldn't have left could mean two things. A, they had some romantic past, or B, she knows something bad will happen to him, or hey, it could be a bit of both. And guess what's parked outside the house here? That silver sedan. The next day, Atticus, George, and Letty embark on their journey to Artem. George runs a guidebook called The Safe Negro Travel Guide, a nod to the Green Book. Even his daughter's comic has an ad for it colored in green on the back. The name of her comic, Arithia Blue, comes from Greek mythology. Arithia was a queen of the Amazons, and George's wife, Hippolyta, is also the name of an Amazonian queen. D, George's daughter, has drawn several monsters on her father's map, including this one of the Grim Reaper atop a clock, foreshadowing how Atticus, George, and Letty literally have to beat the clock in order to survive their encounter with the racist sheriff. But we'll get into that in a bit. As the three travel south, there's a great montage of how it was like living as an African American in the South in the 1950s. Racist billboards, an American Way sign featuring a white family overlooking a lineup of African Americans waiting at the bus stop, and even this separate entrance at a theater. This image is an actual recreation of the 1956 Gordon Parks photo, Colored Entrance in Mobile, Alabama, which was shot for Life magazine. The voiceover during this segment is taken from a legendary debate between James James Baldwin and conservative William F. Buckley, in which Baldwin argued that the American dream came at the expense of blacks. The team stops for lunch at a local diner, which used to belong to a black woman named Lydia. However, it's undergone new management by a group of racist firefighters. Atticus, George, and Letty are actually run out of town and, in one of the most WTF moments of the episode, are saved by the silver sedan. The pursuer's car is completely flipped in the air as if hitting some invisible wall, and the woman who appears from the silver sedan is platinum blonde, blue eyes, and dons red gloves and a hat. But I'll delve more into her when we get to the end of the episode. At Marvin's, things get a little complicated when they learn the history of Artem. Remember that Artem's last known mention was in a county that's presently known as Devon County. Well, the county seat of Devon, the town that is the governmental center of a county, is called Bideford. Bideford happens to be the name of a town in England that had one of the last witch trials. A woman was hung for fornicating with the devil who appeared to her as a black man, and Marvin tells them this new Bideford was founded by witch hunters. For the past several years, people have gone missing in the woods, and he believes it could be the result of a racist sheriff named Eustace Hunt. Artem was settled the same time as Bideford, and according to Marvin, should be located somewhere in this patch of forest. So in order to find Artem, they'll need to traverse Devon County, which is a sundown county. A sundown county is one in which all white municipalities or neighborhoods practice a form of segregation by excluding non-whites via a combination of discriminatory local laws, intimidation, and violence. And that's exactly what happens when they're pulled over by Sheriff Eustace. They're given a few minutes to get out of the county before sundown or else they'll be arrested. And even when they do make it out on time, the sheriff's men stop them down the road, taking them to the forest to be killed. It's here that Lovecraft Country really digs deep into horror as the group is attacked by Lovecraftian creatures known as Shogoth. These many-eyed, Dracula-like creatures are afraid of light, a weakness Atticus, George, and Letty later use to their advantage. Seeking refuge in a nearby cabin, they learn that if they can survive until sunup, they could make their escape. But they'll need more light to last. Luckily, there are flares in the car, and the headlights will help as well. So Letty decides to make a run for it since she was a track star in high school. Unfortunately for Atticus and George, Sheriff Eustace succumbs to his wound and morphs into one of those creatures. And it looks Looks like they're done for until Letty smashes through the cabin, scaring the creature away. But what's really interesting here is when they're surrounded, the sound of a whistle makes the Shogoths back off. Now in Shogoth lore, Shogoths were controlled through hypnotic suggestion. I'm curious if they are somehow controlled by the blonde haired woman or man we see at the end. Notice how this man has a red pocket square just like the woman wore red. The red to me suggests the devil, and we've already had one allusion to the devil when Marvin told them that the last witch trial in 
Bideford was done because a woman had sex with a devil in the form of a black man. I can't help think that there's some sort of connection there. We also see a silver sedan parked outside the giant mansion George, Atticus, and Letty make it to at the end of the episode. This is Artem. The man here says, welcome home, and my mind is spinning with questions. Is Atticus's father here? Likely yes. But what is his connection to these Artem residents? We get a clue early on that Atticus's mother came from ancestors at Artem. Atticus's father found out where his wife's family came from, and that Atticus has a sacred, secret legacy that's been kept from him. So the fact this man says welcome home means that this place is tied to his family secret. I know it sounds crazy, but could he be related to these white guys? Perhaps not by blood, but by some other way. Artem is also said to be the location of Miskatonic University, which sponsored the fossil hunting expedition to the Mountains of Madness. At the Mountains of Madness is another novel by Lovecraft. And the fact we see these digging Shoggoths who seemingly can be controlled and in lore built the cities of their masters, I can't help but think there's a connection and this won't be the last time we see them. So that's it for this first episode of Lovecraft Country, but I want to hear your thoughts and theories about the episode below. Remember to like and subscribe, and for more bat takes, you can follow me on Twitter at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, Daddy loves you very much. 